Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Pasadena Photography Arts Forum. Tonight's presenter, Debbie Arluk, is going to be showing work that spans her remarkably diverse career and will discuss some of the artists whose work has inspired her along the way. Before we bring Debbie out, though, um, again, uh, there are a couple of things we're very excited about that we'd like to mention. Oops, and I'd like the slides to move forward. Um, next Saturday, we're actually breaking out beyond the bounds of Zoom and re-entering the real world for the first time in three years. The Armory in Pasadena, our brick and mortar home before the pandemic struck, has agreed to host a slideshow of photographs we have been privileged to present through open show and forum, along with work by some PPAs, some of PPA's advisors during Pasadena Art Night. Um, we will also be on hand to talk about what we do. So if you're in Pasadena next Saturday night, please stop by and say hello. We'd love to see you. We're also extremely pleased to announce that we have secured fund for a $2,000 award to be presented to one gifted photographic storyteller each year. We are currently accepting applications through uh, April 25th via our website, PasadenaPhotographyArts.org. The juror for this year's inaugural award will be the incomparable Ibarianex Borello. Thank you, Ibarianex. As most of you probably know, Pasadena Photography Arts is a nonprofit organization with most of the work being done by dedicated volunteers. As such, we have been asking for donations to help cover the costs of our continuing operations. We're still very happy to accept your donations. However, we have also instituted a new way that you can support Forum and our other program, Open Show. We're calling it Collect to Support Pasadena Photography Arts. We're now presenting special edition prints by our advisors that are available for purchase on our website with the proceeds to be split between the artists and PPA. Currently, there are two fantastic images available by PPA's founder, Bill Wishner. Visit PasadenaPhotographyArts.org for more information on how you can become the proud owner of an original Bill Wishner. Others will be contributing pieces to the collection over the uh, months to come. So I suggest you check out the website periodically to see what's being added. Oops. Now, Debbie Arluk is an award-winning American artist working in photography. Through diverse photographic processes, Arlick's conceptual work is a response to her surroundings and the larger environment as she attempts to understand the inner and outer worlds of human relationships. Degrees in filmmaking and psychology inform these views. Her work is exhibited in solo and group exhibitions and festivals nationally and internationally. In 2022, she received the Center's Social Award Honor, Honorable Mention Critical Mass Top 50, Lens Culture Summer Open Award, International Photo Awards Official Selection, and was nominated for the Las Fotos Advocacy Award. Our looks work is included in Klompching Edition's Special Edition Prints. She writes for the Photo Book Journal, is an advisor for um, Pasadena Photography Arts, and founded Our Look Printing Services in 2016. Her work is featured in Lens Culture, Feature Shoot, All About Photo, Lens Cratch, Fraction Magazine, Strange Fire, Louis de la Photographie, Frames Magazine, and others. Our look is on the faculty of the Los Angeles Center of Photography and John C. Com Campbell Folk School. Debbie just returned from breaking down a five-month solo exhibition for her award-winning project, One One Thousand at the University of Colorado, Anschutz Medical Campus, uh, Fulginity Center for Bioethics and Humanities. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Fulginity. <laughs> Fulginity, thank you. 20 prints from this project were exhibited recently at the Indian Photo Festival in Hyderabad, India. Debbie and her sister, Lori Sandler, were invited by Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital to present 1-1000 at the Lennox Lombroso Pediatric 
Pediatric Epilepsy Conference, along with an exhibition in September. Work from this series will be in the book, Memory Orchards, published by Candela Press Books this fall. Um, as you may have seen, those of you who are with us, uh, one of you who is attending tonight is going to be the recipient of a very generous gift from Debbie in the form of a one hour consultation. She will be lending her considerable expertise to a photo-based artist at any level of experience seeking assistance honing a project, portfolio sequencing, prepping for portfolio reviews, creating a PDF for portfolio reviews, including design and layout, project statements, and general guidance. The lucky winner will be notified in the next day or two. Tonight, I'd like to urge anyone who, uh, with questions for Debbie to enter them in the chat. We'll address as many of them as we can at the end of uh, her presentation during the Q&A. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce my fellow PPA advisor, Debbie Arlook. Debbie. Hey there. Thanks so much, Doug, and, and, and everyone for being here. I know that, um, so we have to change the camera, I think, yes? Is the camera, we have the camera going good? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for being here because I know you're all so busy. We're all so very busy. And so you took the time out and some people in the car, like Lori was mentioning. So thanks so very much for doing that. And um, I also want to thank the PPA advisors. You know, everybody is, is, a, is a volunteer and we do this because we love it. You know, we're the photographers and we're also the people that like to learn. And so by doing this and learning about other artists, we get to learn more about even our own practice, which is really special. So thank everybody. I thank you all for allowing me to even be a part of this in, in your evening. So I'm going to share my screen. If you give me just a moment and then we'll get started. All right, everybody have that? We're good? Okay, all right. So trusting the journey, developing the photographic voice. The reason I'm calling it this is because I, you know, a lot of times you don't know where you're going. You know, you start out and uh, you just take each day as it comes and you don't know what is going to be the outcome. And in terms of photographing, I started out doing street photography and who knew that I'd be doing uh, photo-based work and, and abstract and all just diff different kinds of things. And along the way, I would have certain people say, you know, teachers would say, well, you have to stick to one thing and this is your voice, this is your signature. But I couldn't do that. I had to go with what my heart was telling me to do. And so that's an important thing. And then that each project then leads leads to the next. So I'll start a little bit here that this is me three and a half in New Jersey. Um, I wanted to show you this picture because you know we're all starting out at some point. And this picture also shows the back of this great imprint from, from Kodak in 1965. And one of the things about pictures when we look at them is we remember, maybe we don't remember a specific time that that moment of that moment of the image but like i remember those shoes the saddleback shoes that we had and that we'd have this white shoe polish that uh when they got dirty we would uh, end up putting this on i don't know if any of you guys remember that my first influence was my dad and my mom and my dad would document everything that was going on in the family you know whether it was a still camera or making you know super eight films and uh, my mom was very much into nature and showing us different things and taking us to exhibitions. So just wanted to share a little bit about that. At uh, eight years old, they, my folks gave me my first camera, the Kodak Iphomatic. And that's a, a picture I took in the upper right of my sisters. We always played around and had them do some goofy things. One thing I couldn't find, but I had this specific memory is pictures of bark on trees. I would go straight to these trees and take some different kinds of formation shots. And I'm sure they were thrown away because my parents thought they were nothing, which I'm sure they were, but who knows. So this is kind of funny. The picture on top I made, this is uh, in Swan Lake, New York. My grandparents had a bungalow colony 
And I saw this picture at top and it's my mom moving and my grandparents are in the window saying, gonna say goodbye to us. And I thought, gee, was this a mistake that I'm doing this um, um, you know, on an angle? And then I found these other two images that were taken around the same time. And I, I could see that I had an idea that I wanted to do something different right on. So that made me feel good. And, and I also, I love the back of all of these old prints with the dates and of course the bicentennial, that's pretty interesting right there and, and uh, documents the time. So this photograph is taken in my backyard in New Jersey. Obviously it's set up and I was already doing a bit of text and image way back then around 1981. And what it says here is the Feldmans in a quiet moment at home. Jackie had been sitting in the chair, but had to make a quick run inside to make pee pee. The girl in the white is, uh, the white shirt is an imposter and I'm the girl in the white shirt. Um, I have no idea really what I'm writing about, but I love the idea of foreground, my dad sleeping, my sisters and I playing around. God only knows again why we've got Maxwell House on her head. And then that chair with my mom who would, who would run away and then, or gone to the bathroom. And then just underneath, you know, little things to look at there. My dad was probably having ice cream and he's reading a book. I don't stage images anymore. Um, I haven't done it for a long time. So when uh, I went to college, uh, I was um, a film major. It was called, uh, what do we call it then? Uh, visual communications. It wasn't film, a film major and a psychology minor. So these were my influences. I did, uh, I did take still images. I worked in the dark room, but this was my main focus and this is my schooling. So I wasn't really taught in terms of still photography, but I wanted to show you this. Um, around 2016, I was making photographs from my television and these are all screen captures from Citizen Kane. And I, I wanted to show this to you because Orson Welles images, or, or, or I say the images, the images within his filming is so unbelievably cinematic and deep that many of them can be still images. And I love just extracting that and looking at the two in the bottom, they're really the inverse of the foreground, midground, background. So this is something that's always in my head. And, and this is a, something I've said, you know, I, after college, uh, you know, I should say I, I won third place, not first, but I won third place uh, for my film. And I felt, well, that's enough for me. I'm, I'm going to LA. I'm going to be a director. And uh, I didn't know anyone except this girl in college. And I, I moved out. And within two years, uh, I, I, or three years, two years, I got married. And then two years after that, I had my first child. So even though I was on my way and doing some things in Hollywood, uh, this became my focus. And uh, I would say to myself, I learned later, you can have everything, just not at the same time is what I would tell myself. And that if we are perfect in our imperfection, and I believe we are, then our actions and our creations and the path we are on is perfect too. So these are ways of the no regrets, right? It's just follow the path, follow the journey. And what's interesting as well is being a housewife and a mom, then there's this idea of, well, who am I? And, and rediscovering myself. So in 2001, as my kids are getting older, I took my first photo workshop ever. And it was with Julia Dean before it was LACP. And Julia made these images. This is in Tijuana. The one on the left, it cracks me up every time. I remember she and I were walking the streets together and she says, wait, just stand there. And I didn't really see what was behind me until uh, after she made the photo, blonde hair, blue eyes, V-neck, uh, black sweater and a white shirt. And cause she even said, don't smile. And it was spot on. I just loved how she saw that. So these are some pictures I made in 2001 uh, during that trip. The one on the left, this woman uh, so very much resembled the do not enter sign and has that do not enter look that I thought that that was a, a great way to um, tell the story. And it's funny too, because you can't even see the, the stand on the sign. Um, and then the, on the right, this guy walking, his feet are the inversion of the tree that's above him. 
and the banner that's moving off to the side kind of looks like that guy. And it has this sense of urgency and mystery. Just gonna breathe for a moment. Uh, this is my Mexican Elvis and these guys, remember we had uh, station wagons that faced backwards. So it's also dating a time. So this would be the first time that I was doing a character study. Uh, this is in 2002. We used to take our kids to, um, it was called Food on Foot in Hollywood. And this gentleman, Mr. Fairbanks was there every week. He claimed to be 103. And one day I said, I, I'd like to, you know, make some portraits of him. And he said, well, come next week and I'll take you to my home, which was this Hollywood hotel. And I remember getting on the floor. Uh, I'd never done this before. I didn't know the guy, just kind of, you know, going in, uh, talking to a lot of people in the hotel, actually. There was one guy who was an amputee. We spoke as well. And it was just fascinating to see this man's room. There were little piggies on those sheets. And uh, there were, it was a cockroach infested hotel. I'm sure it's very gentrified now. So this image um, I, I was the first one I ever submitted and it was from a soccer dad who was a photographer. And, and I showed him uh, some shots that I had. And he said, well, why don't you, you know, take one and just submit it to APA LA. I didn't even know what that was. And it got in and uh, it showed around LA at the Pacific Design Center and Louis Stern Fine Art for about a year which was amazing. And so for me, that was um, affirmation that I'm moving in the right direction and whatever that is, just keep going and follow your heart. This picture was made there that same uh, evening as well. So in terms of documentary, uh, I was in Las Vegas for a family event. And then I went to meet another family member who lived in the area, who was a gambler. And we were just gonna meet for lunch. And he said, I'm going to the World Series of Poker. And this is before it was a thing. This is 2003, as you can see, it's not such a big deal. And um, I said, well, can I meet you there? And so I was able to make all of these images and the fellow in the middle, uh, I didn't know who he was. He wasn't really anybody at, at the time, but he ended up winning. Uh, that event and won $2.5 million. He's now a, a big celebrity. He's won, I don't know how many times he's won, but he's written a couple of books. And his name is actually Chris Moneymaker, which is an interesting story. So it's all about people, uh, these images and um, capturing a moment. Also Tijuana, exposing myself to things that I didn't necessarily like or know about. And this was really hard for me. I, I'd never, I've never gone back to anything like this before. It was really hard, but I'm glad I went. So influences. Photography is a small voice at best, but sometimes, just sometimes, one photograph or a group of them can lure our senses into awareness. W. Eugene Smith. So I wanna share with you uh, my first, Real mentor, Marty Elcourt, very, very special man. Um, I met him on my 40th birthday at uh, Julia's, uh, I guess she had a portfolio night and people just set up their chairs as he's down in Venice. And uh, I was lucky enough to befriend Marty and Marty is an amazing person. And I wanna read something about Marty. He was a member of the Photo League in New York City, and he worked with Aaron Siskin, Paul Strand, and Imogen Cunningham. And how amazing that I get then to uh, study with him. In 19, this is a, a quote from Marty. In 1948, I went to the Museum of Modern Art to meet with the curator of photography, Edward Spiken, Elcourt remembers. He had turned me down two years earlier, telling me that there were 3 million photographers who wanted to be in the museum's collection. But that day, Steichen purchased three of my pictures for their permanent collection. I couldn't feel the ground under my feet for three months. Marty is an amazing guy. Uh, I've, uh, my friend David Schulman is here. 
he and um, David and Marty began the Los Angeles League of Photographers. Uh, and it was a great group of people who just love photography. This is before we had any community in photography. And um, we supported each other. We went out and sh shot together. We critiqued our work. It was a very important time in my life. And uh, David, I'm so glad you're here. And thanks so much for, um, for showing up. And, and I believe Marty's kids are here tonight. I, I can't see all the people, but um, thank you so much. And there's a film about Marty um, and Alexis, Alexis going to, to put that in the chat uh, if so you can learn more about Marty, but he was a humanitarian and he also loved to shoot children. You could see he was shooting people, but he also shot uh, in, in an abstract way, like this shot is very much a, a Cortez shot on the left. He really had a beautiful eye and, and uh, he helped me hone mine. I made the two pictures on the left with Marty when we were shooting on Broadway downtown LA. And, um, you know, so Marty I met in 2002. And so this is 2003, uh, a cool story I'll share another time. Uh, but uh, just to say briefly, the fellow, the cowboy with the ripped shirt, he ended up telling me later, he wore that shirt ripped and torn because he didn't want anybody to think he had anything. He'd been robbed so many times in his life and um, really amazing story. You know, cameras gave us that, that a ticket to go places and to speak to people that you never would. And I do love that about photography. I also went into wildcard boxing, which was crazy because across the way, oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting the name of um, where I brought my film to be developed. They are not there anymore. I'm totally forgetting. But I got to go in and just say, hey, can I shoot here? You can't go into wildcard boxing now. Uh, it's, they're too famous. But um, it was a really cool experience. And the fellow on the right is um, the brother-in-law, and again, I should have written these things down, of the fellow who was also famous, there's a documentary about him, it was Freddie Roach, it's right there, Freddie Roach, that's his brother, who had this huge uh, swastika on his shoulder. And here I am, a nice Jewish girl, and I'm kind of wondering how close do I get, right? Um, but he let me make some photos and he was a nice guy and I actually uh, ended up knowing him um, over the years. Again, photography, right? Such cool stuff. Uh, Philippe's downtown and just that hint of the waitress's elbow, like you just know it's a waitress right there on the second telephone booth from the back. So this is all about shape and design and story. If you look hard enough, I made this with Marty as well. We had finished the day going down to our cars and just seeing things and we had a great time. I spent a lot of time in the Yucatan. Um, and this guy's eyes always just really just bring me in like pools. How his, the shape of his eyes, the eyebrows and the hair coming out, they just sort of take me in and sort of gracefully move me. But he was uh, a sad man. I think he had died the year after. So I took a workshop with Aline in 2002. She was also a great influence. Um, these are uh, Holga images, uh, not the conceptual work, but Aline introduced the conceptual work to, uh, for me. And just this idea of using another camera is a different way of looking and how uh, an image can take on a sense of time. And that I think also a sense of there's like music within images. And I think the music is very different with a, a Holga than, than the other cameras. So again, thoughts and inspiration I'll just share. When I shoot and write, I shift my perception to see with fresh eyes, to see the ordinary is much more. And everything is my influence, photography and the presentations like this. I love listening to other photographers talk about their stories. Uh, podcasts, about Annex is here. I love your podcast. Uh, so, life. Margaret Borkway, absolutely love her work. And what was interesting is I was getting ready for this um, presentation. I, I was doing some more research of her work and how things may have played with mine. And so, that's what you're going to find a lot of how uh, looking at work stays with us 
even though we may not see that image, you know, I actually had never seen this particular image until two days ago, but there are other images of hers and other photographers that, that play into my work. And, and I think that happens with all of us. Everything that we see, uh, everything that we read, you know, plays. Because I didn't mention that uh, Marty, I got to go back about Marty because this is, this is all about this right now. He said to me, read the classics, read Moby Dick, go to plays, go to, go, go, um, to the museums, take in life. He told me this one story, which I absolutely loved about um, Picasso. He says, Picasso wasn't always Picasso. It took Picasso a long time to be Picasso. He studied all of the masters and he mastered them himself and then he became Picasso. And I love that story. And it's the kind of thing, kind of like images, it stays with me. I forget about it and then it comes back. It's like, oh yeah, experiment. Do the things that that feel right. Follow your intuition. Follow your heart. Be you. As they say, everyone else has been taken, you know, and, and you develop. We develop like clay um, every day. I'm always seeing. I'm always looking. And, and I love that. To be curious is, um, I think, keeps us youthful. Again, I, I'd actually never seen this particular image. But I think it's important that we uh, do study photography. We do study different, different types of art and, and let it come through us. Like this image by Carl Benjamin. These are different iterations of it. It comes, how, how does like, how do you put it in a grinder in a sense and then what's going to come out or, or making a soup and putting in all of these ingredients and then what kind of soup are you going to make? And so that's Carl to the upper left and the, all the others are mine. And Brasson, okay. Brasson, what can I tell you about Brasson that you don't already know? But again, how does it come through us? And so I love the pairing, um, the image on the bottom left that I made in Nisla, and then the one of him in Mexico, the boys playing, and then there's a, an adult in the back doing something and the shapes. And, and then this crazy coincidence of, of this woman in, the, uh, in Mexico by Brasson and this very similar position to the woman on the right. Everything's the same except her eyes are, are not looking right at me at this moment. Cortez's images are on the left, mine are on the right. Robert Frank. So what I like about this is we've all done this. Well, maybe not all, but most of us have done this and made this image in one way or another. And if you haven't, get out there and do it because it's so exciting. I have multitude, a multitude of these images. I have many, 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 but I chose the one uh, that I, I took most recently. And every time I get out there now, of course, I, I have Quinn, my partner, who uh, gets to say, okay, there's a car coming, get out of the way. And there's one I was telling Doug the other day, uh, I'm in the street in Manhattan, right next to Madison Square Garden. I didn't put it in, but uh, I hear a siren coming, and I think, oh, this is going to be great. I can get the shot of the train of the um, uh, fire engine going past, but it turned and came directly at me, and so I had to run. Uh, ask me if you want to see that. I will. I will send that to you. I have to take a photograph of that. Agnes Martin says, "Beauty is the master of life. It's not in the eye. It's in the mind." In our mind, there is an awareness of perfection. And I really love that. And then I go to Thomas Moran and John Singer Sargent, such beautiful painters and so very different, but there's this richness to the painting. There is a sense, you know, with Thomas Moran, I'm very much inspired, of course, to create the landscapes that I do. And with Sargent, I, I can't even really explain it. There's just something about the images that pull me in and that's enough for me. And we don't always need to explain it. I once spent an hour with this actual painting and it was a really, really cool experience at, at LACMA. So these are three of the, the uh, blue four, blue four painters. And they're all very spiritually minded artists. 
And yet look at this work. We're talking, looking about it, a, a landscape and we're looking at shapes and, and design. And all of that comes through in my work, this idea of shape and design, yet they're also very different. The things that we think that um, is so very different than ours still may have an element. So Ellsworth Kelly, when I started noticing Ellsworth Kelly's paintings and sculptures, uh, I couldn't really tell you why, uh, but he also did photography. He was a photographer and he would talk about how uh, when he would see something, he then would want to sort of replicate it in a different way. He wasn't just sort of giving you everything at face value. And so here he has trained landscape. And I've made this California landscape. Um, I actually hadn't seen train landscape. I had seen other things. And I, had, you know, there's um, uh, Rauschenberg's work and Ed Ruscha's work, you know, the way they have their design. And all of it comes through me in a way. And I think I was taking Eileen Smith's in class at the time. And maybe she suggested to try to make a painting, uh, have a painting inspire you to make an image. And so this is me when I started making multiple, or I should just say double, be very clear, double exposure in camera uh, work. And that's what all of these are. Um, and then it's, you know, exploring photography outside of straight photography, outside of just street photography or documentary. And so breaking out into a different way of how can I use the art to express myself. And so this is the photo based work where then I'm changing the color and chiaroscuro to, to make things that look very different. Another reason I was doing this is because um, I was a life coach at the time. And uh, one of the things that I was doing with my clients was helping them or guiding them to see life in a different way. Like how could they see their experiences instead of being negative as seeing them as something uh, that is making them who they are today and how they can grow from it. So I kind of use my own idea of um, spirituality and bettering my own self as a person um, and growth. So all, all that, all that was uh, very important to me. And then Albers, I mean, check this out. I mean, it kind of, astounds me it wasn't anything that I could have known that I was making at the time and it's it's this idea you know when we're in the dark room and and the image reveals itself uh with the chemicals you know as we're, we're shaking our trays and and that's what this is happening that's what's happening to me here even though this is digital um it's kind of fun to have that reveal still even in digital I don't even know how that happens sometimes but I, I guess what I want to say with all of it and, and word to, to Hockney is this sort of collective visual language that, that's happening and, and how it comes through and translates. So here's this, this idea of appropriation and, and pop art and this idea for me, I was questioning art. What is art? What is the beauty of art? Uh, you know, Duchamp's idea, you know, when he made the, the, um, the toilet bowl. Uh, so I... I'm always going to galleries and uh, museums. And here I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and there was this retrospective of Hockney's work. And I was watching the sort of dance of, um, of patrons and I decided to photograph them, but not in the way they've been photographed before. And by using their silhouette in these pop art colors, the sort of California colors, I could, make a new conversation about the artwork. And here is Hockney saying, it takes a long time to make it simple. It's so very true. And uh, Mark Twain also said, he, he, he says, it's, I'm, I'm not gonna get it exactly right, but this idea, he wrote his mom a letter and he said, dear mom, um, uh, I'm sorry I didn't have time to make this shorter. And it's true, you know, to make things simple really does take some time. He also said something else. Uh, he said that perspective should uh, should be reversal, especially for photography. And I have that. I keep that quote on my wall, and I've had it here for years. And I don't always understand that. 
And I like that I don't always understand it, or I like that I interpret that differently every time. This image is very much of a confusion. Uh, it, it, I don't know if that's the right word, but this is straight photography and you wouldn't know it. Um, I, the only thing that I have manipulated is the color and yet it, it appears to be much more. So I think that for Hockney, um, maybe he would like this image because uh, there is a reversal and a confusion to it. And by the way, you guys are the first to see this. Uh, no one has ever seen this before. Uh, just some more influences. And again, I guess what I want to say is, I didn't see any of these work and say to myself, I'm going to recreate this. That didn't happen, it doesn't happen. So there is um, an exhibition. This is actually, I think the fourth or fifth, fifth time maybe uh, that Perceive Me is showing around California. Christine uh, is an amazing artist and she's a, an educator herself. Um, she asked about 50 artists working in different mediums to make work of her, whatever their medium one, and mine of course is photography, uh, to photograph her nude or to portray her nude. The reason being is she has body issues and she wanted to get an idea of what it was like to have the experience to be seen, right, um, by other artists. And then what, it, what was it like for the other artists to take part in this? And so if you haven't seen Perceive Me, um, you can go online. I think uh, Alexi is gonna post that in the chat as well. And we've got an exhibition, the last one, uh, that is opening up uh, March 16th in San Diego. I'm taking a pause for a moment so you can take a look. All the series is a real great influence of mine and Ed Roche, as I mentioned it before. And actually Erica is in the audience and I made this photo with her, meaning she was with me when we went to this exhibit at LACMA. And I just, I don't know again, what compels me to do things, but, and it's funny to use the word compel. So here he's got, we've got the spectator shot and next to it was this uh, double spread. And so here I am doing this double exposure and I make this new image. So uh, in 1-1000, uh, which you know, I'll get to in a little bit, uh, this idea of visual language, things that we see and take part in every day, holding a child and how it can be interpreted through art. It's important for us, I think, to recognize and see that life is reflected in our art. You know, Michelangelo with the Pieta in this magnificent sculpture and W. Eugene Smith in Minamata with this girl who was affected by, um, uh, oh gosh, what was the poisoning? I forget, mercury poisoning in Japan. And then that's my sister holding my nephew David during his seizure. Dwayne Michaels, of course, uh, the writing uh, on the image, which of course you can see I've done here and doing it my, my own way. And then Ed Ruscha with his writing and a lot of his writing is, is humorous. And to me, I took it also as with the humor, but also poetic. And so I have in this image that was made in Grand Central Station, I have a series called Rendezvous. And I just came up with a story. After she applied her lipstick, she realized she hated the color. So I'm gonna start showing you some of the work um, that, that I've made, uh, just a few of the series. Seen and Heard was the first one, and I have to mention Aline again. Um, I was making these uh, desolate, desert landscape images and you know brought them in one day and she was like well you know these are great and, and what can we do with this you know let's the idea was to create um conceptual work and I had never done that before so what happened was I had recently moved 
and um, I was alone. I, 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 you know, this is after my divorce, and I would often hear these overheard conversations, and I started documenting them. And one day I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to put these together. I'm going to put these together and create new meaning to this overheard conversation in Hollywood, to this place that says they're people, but they're, they're devoid of people. So this is, are you happy? And I don't know if you can see it, but between the railing, the, the ladder going into the pool, it says, are you happy? And there's actually writing in the back on the sign, which you can't read. And it says, here lies the ashes of Graham Nash. So it's this idea of marrying text and image and, and how, uh, how they, they work with each other. And the reason I had the text in the beginning, I actually had it where you could see the text more blatantly, but over time I recognized that it became more about the text and these images were strong enough uh, that I, I all, and, and it was more that they, were, that they were strong enough. It was more that I wanted that sort of mind shift of like, okay, I'm now, the viewer, I'm going to look at this and what does this tell me? And then I will either look at the title or, or this, the words that are put to it. And then that will then can change my perception or not, but it, it, it has its own story. And I, I want the story to be your story and not my story. Brian Scutmat, um, this is such beautiful work. Um, I went to Chico Hot Springs for reviews last year, and he said, "Humans are human for a are human for a short time. Photography is an expression of one state of soul." And I just love hearing that. So, in terms of the soul, that uh, brings me to foreseeable cash, which is the merging of the physical and spiritual realms, and Spiritual cash is this conjured term for awaited memories and, and what the soul knows. And I made these on these you know, sacred uh, Native American lands. This is uh, Monument Valley. And being in this space, as I say, this sacred and, and mystical land that has so much history, um, it was very quiet for me. I could get quiet. You could just hear the wind, you know, as if, if you're, you're hearing something so much more than the wind. And again, I'm doing these multiple exposures. And again, I don't, I say again, and more again, because why am I doing it? I don't know, but I follow my instincts. I decide to make one image and put another one on top of it. And it has to be the right image. And the way I'm working with the, the Fuji on X-T1, for this work. And I have to make the second picture pretty quickly after the others. Um, and so I make the one image and then I just sort of look a little like from the left and to the right. And then I just sort of feel, and I can see what I'm doing, just so you know, I can see the image I'm putting over it and how uh, they're going to fit. I don't know what the outcome is. And especially when I first began this, I had no idea what the heck I was doing. Um, you can see there's a band to the right, and I'll, I'll show you in the next image. Uh, there are little bands in between. I made this diptych, and I'll show you again on the left and right side the band. The band is a portal. I see it as that portal uh, into meditation, into that state of mind where you sort of you clear that channel. And the desert has always done that for me, which is why there are these two projects where I am shooting in the desert. It's it's very clear, um, it's quiet, you know, it, like those the the shows of the the vast road, you know, this road of possibilities. And it's just a moment where one can reflect. You can look inward and be quiet, and and it's sort of this internal external landscape. 
which is why the work is inverted, by the way. And I like to see things differently. It's good to have an end to, an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end, Ernest Hemingway. I choose that quote because of this next series called Edge of an American Dream, which is passing through time by car. And I have American in quotes because is the American dream realized? Is it a dream? Is it a memory? This work is um, all made from a moving car. My, my partner Quinn is, is driving. We, took, uh, we do take road trips all the time. We're going to family and um, they're long rides, 14, 16 hour rides sometimes. And I'm almost awake through every bit of it. And when I say awake, I mean literally alert to each moment. I have my camera ready. When I'm making these shots, I know what I'm looking for and they happen fast. I look uh, like a smidgen, like I'm looking out the side, you know, the window, and then I can see what's coming up and I get the camera ready. And then I kind of just turn it very quickly to get the shot. And I have uh, everything set to be able to hone in on something that's in focus, but I want the rest also to be out of focus. And it's this sensation of nostalgia. It's a glimpse of a memory or a dream. And it's all made in these, you know, small, uh, small towns, like these flyover states. It's not like the destination, right? It's the journey. This is the part that, that is important. And, you know, by looking at these, you know, I could say, well, I wouldn't say that the American dream is realized here, but who am I to say that? And what was the American dream and, and whose? And, and it's promised, but is it promised to everybody? So each of these towns and cities has their own story. Even though the people aren't seen, they're there and they have a story. And it's important to, uh, to look at that story. And, and the title is the date and time because I didn't want to put anything more to these images other than the date and the time. It didn't really matter where they were made. Um, I've had people in uh, you know, different countries tell me how it reminded me of their country. And I, I thought that was pretty cool to hear. Uh, uh, Joanne Dugan introduced me to Ann Truitt and um, she was a sculptor and she has so many beautiful quotes and this one stood out to me. Artists have no choice but to express their lives. And um, I'm gonna be talking about 1-1000 next, which is why I'm talking about this quote because it is a, the first time I'm actually, even though beforehand it was parts of my life, it wasn't so explicit, uh, it wasn't a documentary. And, and I'm quoting Daniel Coburn here, don't practice what you already know. Um, because I took um, a workshop with him uh, in, I guess, six months after or seven months after I was working on 1 1000. And because of that workshop and the sort of freedom to do anything, he said, don't do what you know, like try different things. Don't, you know, go completely out of the box. It was like I gave my permission, myself a permission slip to go just crazy and I did. And that's how things changed and made 1-1000 what it is. Um, and I'm not finished yet. I'm going to, I want to do more, um, uh, you know, just one piece images. I want to make more tactile images and also do some AI work and AR work and do uh, hybrid technology. I've, I've paired with uh, someone who are, um, we're gonna collaborate together. We're just looking to raise money to, to do that. Um, but I think it'll be really exciting. And I just finished a, a five month exhibition at the Colorado University, as Doug mentioned earlier, and, um, and Harvard has invited us to speak because what we've seen, and Harvard said this before, we even had the exhibition in Colorado, it's this idea that by showing 
what happens, and I'll, I'll just go to the first image of David, uh, by showing what happens with the family uh, in long-term care and the one being cared for, it reminds the medical students and their doctors why they uh, were in that field to begin with. So there's more to it, but this is David. Um, if you don't know um, ab about this, it's, well, 1,000 is a different kind of love story and it's a collaboration with my sister who's here. And, and I think David actually is on too. We'll see if maybe they wanna say hi later. Um, uh, Lori's my baby sister and you know, take care of your baby sister even though she's always lived across the country for me. And then she moved to Colorado and still far. I'm in, I'm in uh, Santa Monica, California. And um, during the pandemic, the first summer, uh, you know, so many of us hadn't seen each other or family members for so long. I, I drove out to stay there for like a week or so. And while I was there, um, I was photographing, you know, as I, I do, just no reason, just, you know, as we all do, right? We pick up our cameras and we see something, we make an image. And I was photographing David. And in that moment, I get this sort of message that says it's my own voice. And it's saying, you need to make a project of Lori and David. And I'm like having this conversation back with myself, as I'm sure many of you do. Well, I've never made a documentary before. I wouldn't even know how to do that. And uh, it didn't matter. It's like, you'll figure it out was the answer. And so I asked Lori if I could make this project. And, you know, she waits for a long time thinking about it because this is, you know, an intimate thing to, to agree to. And, and it's pretty hard to do something like that to show what's happening in your home, things that are not easy. And she says, yes. And then I realized I have to ask David and David is nonverbal. Let me just tell you a little about, bit about David. He has an incurable form of epilepsy. Um, he, and this has been since he was two years old, so he's nonverbal. And um, he also is, his communication is, is so limited. It's not like he can use sign language or point to something. Um, it's very difficult to understand David. And so I knew though, I wanted his permission to move forward. And I believe, uh, and we all believe in our family that David understands and is probably a heck of a lot smarter than most of us. Um, when I asked David, he, um, I think he was moving back and forth. I remember he was, my sister remembers that he wasn't, but often David will do this. And I said, David, I will, do this with respect, with honor, and with love. And if ever I make you uncomfortable, let me know. And can we do this? And I'll take this my glasses off because of the reflection. David did something he'd never done before. And you know, he wasn't looking at me as I asked him, but then I asked the question and he went, he just leaned in. And he held my gaze for probably 10 seconds or so. And my sister and I look at each other and I'm like, holy shit, we got our answer. And um, then we started making the work. So that was the summer of 2020. And um, I'm really proud of Lori. I'm really proud of David. Lori says, I specific, this is her, her handwriting, by the way, and, and her words. I specifically chose a home with an open floor plan so David can easily be seen if he has a seizure. When I'm cooking or doing dishes, I'm often singing or talking to David. Sometimes I wonder if he pretends to sleep, so I'll shut up. So this work has um, multiple uh, forms of um, I guess expression, I'll say. And all of the works that I've shown you that I've done are kind of in here in one way or another. And the reason I do that is to express this sense of where is David? Where does he go? We, we don't know what he thinks. We don't know what he feels. Uh, Lori's handwritten narrative is very important. It's important to have her fingerprint literally in, in this story. 
um, it is our collaboration of the three of us. That's David's helmet and beads. Um, the beads he uses um, soothe him. It's a form of self soothing. David also has severe autism and scoliosis. Uh, people on the spectrum often use uh, something in a repetitive manner to, to calm them. Lori also uses beads to distract him in a way uh, when he's eating, uh, to help him to eat. Because a lot of times he won't eat. And if she gives him the beads, he'll take a bite. So this is an inversion because, again, like I was saying, where does David go? And, and who is he? And, and he's so much more than just the body which is why I've got this diptych and using the, the different sizes of the body. And the colors, I use different colors that, that uh, express different emotions. I remember the first time I noticed the weakening of David's left side. He was three years old, standing in the living room after recovering from a strong seizure. I stood nearby, watching him from behind. His left arm and, shunk, and shoulder hung limp. His back curved to the left and his shoulder looked tense as if the right side was doing all the work to hold up his body. This is, um, Lori and David are a part of each other. And when I say that, they define each other in terms of their roles, you know, as, as a husband and wife would do, a mother and child would do. But Lori's role is the caregiver and David as the one being wow. cared for. So this image, uh, the reason I'm, I'm making this sort of collage uh, and, and, and it's not a perfectly formed collage by any means and it's not meant to be. Um, and, then, and then the colors, this way of it being more light, like even though something really serious is happening, this is a seizure and, and Lori's holding David's hand and his fingers back so they don't dig in to his own hand. And just the other day when I was in Colorado, uh, David uh, broke the skin on Lori. He had such a severe seizure and that lasted so long. And by the way, they were just in the hospital for a couple of days. Um, David had um, aspirated vomit while he was having a seizure. And, and even though I tell you this story in this way, they're not victims. Uh, they're just, they're amazing people. Like we're all amazing people here and their, their lives are uh, different than, than yours and mine. And the reason Lori and I decided to make this story about the long-term caregivers, because this is just one story of the countless untold stories that happen around the world. And there isn't enough care for the family caregivers. There are many caregivers say that, and it's like two, is it number three out of five caregivers say that they are depleted and um, need care themselves. And one out of every five families, this is from the 2020 consensus. So it's three years yet still for, for new numbers, but the consensus said that there are one out of five families that have long-term family care. So something needs to be done in our system to, to help people because they don't get enough care and they're having to pay for so many things. And here's my sister, she's an intelligent woman and she has to work so hard to get the care that they have and she does so much for herself. What, what about the people that aren't as educated and don't have the resources? So much like the other image, there's this sense of um, surreal, uh, surrealism because there are so many unanswered questions. And this has this organic sense that even though David is different and even though that the shape of the, the um, trunks of the trees are, are curved and David's back is curved and his hands are curved, it's natural, it's natural. There's so many interpretations to this one. I'll let you guys come up with your own.
Lori says she feels that she and David have walked this path many times before. It's just a couple of installation shots from uh, Colorado University, taken by my friend Carl Bauer. And I'll just show you this real quick. Oh, there we go. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> this is when um, we were just setting everything up for our exhibition, and uh, it was kind of fun to put that on the elevator. So thank you all so very much. For, for being here, um, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Let me try if I get to stop share here. Hold on one second. There Thank you, go. Debbie, so much for um, sharing this extraordinary journey you've been on and continue to be on. Um, Thank you. It's great to see um, all of the work and, and your um, thoughts and feelings about them. Um, I do have a question. Um, I know that you have ongoing um, uh, plans for um, 1 1000 um, in particular. And um, all of these things um, take um, not only a lot of a uh, great deal of time and, and um, effort on your part, part but also um, uh, can be very expensive. And um, I was wondering if that was something that you're going to be addressing soon. Uh, yeah, I've been applying for grants one after the other. Um, we did get help with the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado in, in uh, Wyoming when we were in Colorado. But uh, if there's anybody in the audience that knows of, of great resources for us, you know, uh, as I was saying, I, I want to um, collaborate with uh, this wonderful uh, designer who will help uh, create AI. Uh, um, when we do that, we'll be able to sort of simulate what it's like to be the caregiver or the one that's being cared for, and that breeds compassion for people. And we'd be able to do this like in a dedicated website, and anyone around the world can have that experience. So we want to take it further. Um, it's something I'm also introducing to Harvard, and maybe they'll be interested. I don't know. But um, we're also um, making film. We're making a documentary film. I've been shooting since. Uh, September and uh, going to start editing a sizzle reel and we'll start pitching that and then to get some funding. So if anybody knows of any resources, please reach out and, and let me know. But thanks for asking. Thanks for sure. asking. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we um, open up um, to comments and questions if anybody has them. Um, we have a few minutes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how people are going to let themselves know because uh, the chat has been yeah. um, lighting up just in the last uh, couple of minutes. Awesome. But, yeah. Thank you. If you've seen any questions or if anybody wants to like raise your hand, you know how you guys do that at the bottom? It says raise hand, just click on that. Um, yeah, that's probably the best idea. And then uh, ask away. And I see Lori. Lots of here. really Hi, great Sister comments. Lori. Okay, I will read them all. I will read them all. Thank you so much. I will read them all for sure. And thank you again, all of you for being here. It really um, touches my heart. And, and I thank you so much for showing up. It's funny, there's this picture of Abe. <laughs> oh, wait, was that? Yeah, yeah. Abe killed us. He's, it's, it's just his picture and he's like this standing up, but he's really not asking a question. But Becky, can you um, <laughs> unmute yourself? Hi, Becky. Hey, I am unmuted. I would. I, I love your work, but I'm really taken with your, um, like your landscapes where you say you're doing double exposure and then you put all this color in there. Can you just talk a little bit about what you're doing? I mean, I don't want to know all your secrets, but I'd like, a, <laughs> I'd like a, a, a hint as to where you're, how you're, how you're working that. Are you just, so, is that all in Photoshop after your how does that work yeah so it's in camera the, the images are made in camera all i'm doing in post is changing the chiaroscuro and the color and then i add that portal that that veil 
and that's all done in Photoshop. And the color comes to me in this sort of sense of um, what it feels right. And, and so I was always thinking of the chakras when I'm making that. Where am I in my state of mind? What, what chakra is kind of speaking to me in that moment? Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so I guess basically you're creating lines in Photoshop or something where you can maximize colors in one. Yeah, I go into every channel. I go yeah. into every yeah. channel and I play it out and it's so, so detailed that I. You're making masks. Like right now. Yeah, I'm making masks as well. And um, I, if I were to make one now, I'd have to re-remember re how to do it. There is no set formula. Right. I don't want to stick to one certain something and it's always different. So it may sound not that it isn't very productive because it does take me a very long time to make those pieces. Um, but I don't want it to be the same every time. So, yeah. And, and uh, clumping is so exciting. Uh, Deborah and, and Darren um, chose the, the first image, which is a uh, uh, Percival Cash number three pink and it's part of their special editions which was really cool you know it's like all of us like you guys are my friends you're artists that i know are, are, are like me in that sense of we don't make the work to be bought we don't make the work for any reason except we have to make the work we want to make the work it's part of us it's it's why we're making the work and if it gets recognized in some way. It's like, that's the cherry on top. Like, okay, this is cool. Uh, this is really cool. And having you guys here, you're the cherry on top for me right now because you're saying, hey, um, your work is meaning something. And it kind of almost makes me want to cry because never did I ever think I would be in this situation where um, people really wanted to see the work. It was really more just about this is something that I'm making and there was no, um, there was no destination to it. But along the way, when we're becoming more serious about it, it's like, okay, well, now you gotta show it. You can't keep it in your files or, or in a notebook. And that's the hard part. And then the publicity about it. Yeah, thanks so much for asking, Becky. And your work is fantastic. Becky also does really great work uh, about her parents and um, very heartfelt. And, and I guess that's that's the that's the secret sauce. It's got to come from the heart, right? Yeah. Go well, ahead, Judd. Thank you. Yeah, unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Judd. Yep. Yep. Arrowhead. There, you go. there we go. Uh, great presentation, Debbie. It was just so great to see this whole journey in one you know piece. I, I found it so interesting to see photographs from a young child off kilter. I, I, I don't see it, you rarely see it. It takes a special kind of a mind and an eye to do that. I know. <laughs> so as you were doing the presentation, I was thinking, I, I don't see a lot of that as your work progresses, Hard, really hardly any. And I thought to myself, have you found a truer horizon? Have you found a balance that no longer is the off kilterness inside a, a linear image? Because I didn't see any more of that. Is there any any part of your journey relate to that? Um, I use it more in street photography, and I do have that with images with David. I haven't shown them all, um, but I think there's got to be a reason for it. Everything that we do and show within an image, there's got to be a reason. They can't be a haphazard thing. So if it's going to be off kilter, there's got to be a reason to have it off kilter. So, and, and then with some of the images, it has its own story within it that I don't then have to hit you over the head with it. Like this is over, you know, because I had, I had a, uh, the emptiness to find stuff, which is the lines that I showed when I was showing um, the Carl Benjamin work. I was showing that at Photo Independent many years ago, I think 2006. And I saw another photographer, I don't know if he was from Sweden or something, and he had different colored frames and they were so cool. And I said, oh, I should put like a red frame around mine, you know, because this is very graphic and it would be a lot of fun. And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, because then it becomes about the red frame. So it's the same about the kilter. It's like, where do you want 
your audience to see what do you because I'm believe it or not I'm telling you what I want you to see without shouting it I think that's really it's so apt it, it is it's telling without shouting and and uh and your eye is just drawn drawn in it's just really great stuff really great thanks thank you guys for showing up good to see you Jazz is amazing. He's a jazz player. He's a drummer. He plays down at uh, what's it, the uh, LA Athletic Club on Thursday nights, guys. Go, let's all go together. You guys here in LA, we got to go. It's so old school and really cool. Philip, did I see your hand go up? No, I was just saying hi, and I was going to send you a note. I have to, unfortunately, this is really wonderful. I am, I am so moved. Um, by your work, your life story, and and the project. I mean, it's it's it, this is wonderful evening. I unfortunately have to leave. I have to. My dog had surgery. I have to go pick him up from the dog uh, hospital. I hope he's so, okay. Thanks for yeah, showing up. I have up. to Thanks go. So but um, I was kind of waving goodbye, and I was just going to say you okay. <laughs> I got you your wave. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. And I want to thank Stephanie for being here. Stephanie Elcourt Toy Ford, that's her dad that I was talking about. And Stephanie made a documentary film um, about, I think, what's it called? Mirror, Mirror a Man. And, and we posted that in the chat. If you guys want to watch and see more about Marty and this film that Stephanie made, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's an American Mirror. And I, I put the link uh, to his website. The film is also on his website. And it's martinelcourt.com. And he was a writer and a painter and a photographer. And there's a lot of his stuff on there. So enjoy. It. Yeah. Thank you, for, thank you for your kind words about him. I'm very touched. Oh, well, he touched my heart for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one time for one last question, if anybody has. Lori, did you Quick want one. to say hello? Yeah. Is David there? here hello everybody but unfortunately he had a seizure when you started talking oh. about 2000 yeah so he's recuperating yeah. from that um, right. we'll give him a kiss give him a kiss yeah. this was fabulous deb really fabulous i loved seeing our home photos and how you really beautifully brought us through the whole arc of your development as an artist you know, I've seen, of course, over the years, the bits and pieces as you've progressed, but you just beautifully brought us through your, your whole work, your whole journey. And I'm so proud to be your sister and to be in, in this project with you. You're um, so talented and smart and beautiful. And I'm not surprised all these wonderful people are here to hear you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, sister. Love you. Love you too. Okay. Well, Debbie, um, once again, um, thank you so much. That was uh, a really remarkable experience. And um, I think I'm, I'm speaking for, for everybody who's in attendance. <clears throat> um, with that, um, I think it's time for us to close. Um, I want to thank everybody for their support by showing up. And um, um, I, we also deeply appreciate whatever um, financial help you can give us. So I'm, I'm going to urge um, you, if, if you do feel the urge, um, to go to our website and um, hit one of the donate buttons. Um, it, it is absolutely essential to us continuing to do um, events like this. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. and. Um, uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks so much, guys. Big love, abrazos y besos, amore. Have a great night and keep shooting and do what you love. Thanks so much. That was fun. Ciao. Thanks, Thanks Debbie. Debbie. Thanks, Deb. Good Thank night. You guys. Night. Love y'all. Good night. Night. Thank you. Night. Night. Thank you.